today, Dr. Ken Samples. Uh, Dr. Samples, tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry and how people can follow you. Well, thank you, Joshua. It's good to be with you. Um, yes, my name is Ken Samples. I work at Reasons to Believe, which is a old earth science faith apologetics organization. Uh, I'm a member of the scholar team. There are uh, five of us that are full-time scholars who work on the uh, RTB scholar team. I'm kind of the oddball in the sense that I'm a non-scientist. My background is in uh, philosophy and theology. And uh, I've worked here at Reasons to Believe with Hugh Ross for, I think I'm working on my 22nd year. So I try to help the team work through various issues relating to uh, a science faith apologetic uh, coming from a, a theological and philosophical uh, aspect. Uh, in the past, I worked at the Christian Research Institute, used to host at times the Bible Answer Man, and I'm an adjunct uh, teaching apologetics at Biola University. So those things keep me busy. And, and you were saying that you were uh, about to publish uh, a paper, is that correct? It's actually a book. I uh, have a book coming out in the early spring, maybe February or March, entitled Classic Christian Thinkers, an Introduction, that looks at nine uh, very, very influential Christian thinkers, starting in the early church, going through the medieval period, into the Reformation, and all the way up to, to the time of C.S. Lewis. So that'll be a book that's really trying to help people grasp a basic historical theology, helping evangelicals maybe coming to grips a little bit more with the importance of studying church history. So that's a couple months away, but I hope uh, your listeners might look for that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's church history is something that we're very passionate about here on the program. As, as we talk about theology, we, we want to make sure that people aren't picking up new doctrine, right? If it's new, uh, you good. know, we, we've been uh, uh, within the, the Pentecostal charismatic movement for a long time, and, and one of the things that constantly circulates in the movement is we want a fresh word. I always go to pastors when they say that stuff, and I'm like, look, you don't want a fresh word. You want something that's old, <laughs> it's 2,000 years old minimum, Amen. something that's faithful, something that was uh, that Christ taught, that he passed down to the apostles, and it was disseminated to the church. We we don't need another word. We don't need a fresh word. We need something that's historic and true. So I think uh, studying the church fathers and studying, studying church history is very beneficial to the body of Christ. I think Jude talks about the faith that was once handed down through talking about our forefathers in the faith. But um, too much on church history. Let's move back onto our subject today of apologetics. Sure. Um, give us a, a, the word apologetics for our layman who's listening. Give us an understanding of what that is and kind of the classical approach to apologetics. Yeah, the word uh, uh, apologia or apologia is a New Testament word. It appears a couple times. Uh, it's defined as the, a reasoned defense of the faith. And uh, I think in, in some respects, the New Testament word kind of conveys what we mean today by worldview. And so uh, uh, apologetics was seen historically as a, a branch of theology. It wasn't an independent uh, enterprise all itself. It was part of Christian theology. And I, I think it's very important for people to appreciate that apologetics is a branch of theology. We want to keep our apologetic ideas, our apologetic practices tied to historic Christianity, to the biblical text. And uh, certainly the mandate to do apologetics is uh, First uh, Peter 3.15, always be ready to give to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Uh, so apologetics is discussed in the writings of Paul. It's discussed by Peter. Uh, we see uh, the apostles doing it. We see Jesus interacting with members of the Jewish tradition. So apologetics has a deep history. Uh Christians don't always agree on exactly the same methodology to use, but I, I think it's it was used robustly in history, and I think it serves a very important purpose today. So when you say that people don't always agree on the way that it's to be used, um, you know, what are the different ways that you can use apologetics? Isn't apologetics just making a defense for your faith? Isn't 
any defense for your faith uh, an appropriate defense, or are there inappropriate ways to defend the faith? Yeah, I, I think in a I think in a popular sense, you're right. Any any defense of the faith is to engage in apologetic. It it may be a, appealing to evidence for the resurrection, or it may be arguing for the existence of God, or it or it may be contrasting Christianity with with Islam and Eastern mysticism. I think all of that constitutes good, solid apologetic thinking. When it comes to the more technical areas about, you know, how to think about evidence, how to think about the relationship of these various arguments to the biblical revelation, then you have different schools of apologetics. I tend to think that these schools, whether it would be a classical school, an evidential school, presuppositional school, uh, a cumulative case, new reformed epistemology, uh, there was a book that came out a number of years ago, Five Views of Apologetics. I think those schools have more in common than they do in area of difference, but sometimes they do differ about uh, uh, issues relating to arguments and, and scripture and things of that nature. Or even epistemology, I right? View, I tend to view all of them as helpful. Yeah. Excellent. So, so um, you had mentioned just a moment ago, uh, like even a presuppositional apologetics, and that's something that I think we should circle back around and talk about. But let's give give us you were passionate about church history. Give us an understanding of maybe some of the classical apologetical approaches. So, say I'm a non-believer. Okay, I, you know I don't I don't believe in this God. I'm gonna call myself an atheist for the for the sake of the example. What would be classical approaches to defend the faith um, or to to maybe uh, convince this person of, of their need for a savior? Well, I think there are two schools that are, that are pretty close together, uh, the classical approach and the, the evidential approach. The classical approach is characterized by appeals to what we call the classical arguments for God's existence. You see these arguments uh, maybe in their fullest form in the Middle Ages, uh, you see them coming forth in people like Thomas Aquinas, uh, Anselm of Canterbury, uh, other thinkers. So here we're dealing with arguments like the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, the ontological argument. And all of these arguments often presented in a deductive form, however, sometimes presented as maybe a best explanation. And we can talk about that if you'd like. But these are, these are the traditional arguments that have their aim at arguing that God does indeed exist, either based upon aspects of the creation, whether it, it's its existence, or it's coming into existence, its design, or our moral state, our moral condition, or the ontological argument, which is a, a purely, um, uh, it is much more uh, appeal to kind of a, a rational approach to God, that God is, uh, uh, God is in reality uh, uh, the, a maximally perfect being. So that classical school appeals largely to those traditional arguments. Uh, evidentialism, which I think is a sister school, often will appeal to evidence for the resurrection, appeal to prophecy in the life of Jesus, the existence of the church that emerges out of the great events of Jesus's life. And so these schools emphasize the idea that Christianity is a faith that can be supported, it can be evidenced, uh, that it should be, that it should be contrasted with other uh, worldview system, religions, or philosophical elements. So uh, arguments are seen as valid, they're seen as robust. Um, and you often see people today doing this kind of apologetics. Uh, William Lane Craig, for example, is a good example of a classical approach to apologetics. My friend Gary Habermas uh, on the evidential side, arguing for the uniqueness of the resurrection of Jesus. I think these two schools are very, very popular, very common. Um, I, th I think back to my early reading of Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, John Warwick Montgomery, 
these are the kind of evangelical, evidentialist, and classical thinking. Okay, so we have, um, uh, whoop, sorry, of, of these inv- evangelical thinkers that talk about uh, these these approaches. You know, we talk about the the ontological, the the teleological, you know, the moral argument, the cosmological argument of these arguments. Um, don't these arguments just push you to theism? Do they actually push you to Christianity, or are they just the the onset, just to get you into theism, so that from theism you can make the the deduction? So like. I forget which one's which, but I think you said it was the ontological argument, the idea that this there is a supreme being, that supreme being must be perfect in his perfection, must mean that he is one, uh, in, in I- the idea that there's a plurality of gods means that there's there's not one that can fulfill that uh, that perfection. So so there must be one, and, and from that, that's monotheism, but even, even there, it, it sounds like it takes a, a leap and a jump to get to Christ- Christianity. Uh, maybe, maybe give us an understanding of that. Yeah, I I think that those in the classical school, evidential school, they see, uh, they don't think that there's a one-shot apologetic argument necessarily. Uh, Maybe the person needs to come to believe that there is a theistic God, that one can take monotheism seriously, uh, arguing God as either the best explanation for the creation of the world, the design, fine-tuning of the world, morality. Uh, Obviously, there are then other issues. I mean, if you are to make a a rational case for the existence of a theistic God, a person may reasonably ask, but but why not Islam? Why not Judaism? Why Christianity in particular? At that point, often they would shift to the uniqueness of Jesus, arguments for the resurrection, uh, the appeal uh, to his uh, prophetic kind of elements. And more so of an evidentialist. I in, yeah, I, and I think in the classical and evidentialist school, often there are a series of arguments. I mean, there's a whole other school that I'm kind of sympathetic to called a cumulative case. That is, I think there are a series of arguments that buttress a theistic worldview that back up a historic Christian perspective And it may be a series of arguments, some to argue for a theistic God, others to argue for the particulars of Christianity. Gotcha. Okay, so so run us through maybe one or two of those arguments. What do you think, um, of the four that we talked about, what would you think are the two most compelling arguments um, that we could could approach an unbeliever with? That's a really, really good question. Uh, I think all four of them are are very, very robust. They're very rich. Uh, the cosmological argument, there's a couple versions of the cosmological argument. You can argue for the very existence of the universe, or you can argue in the Kalam for the beginning of the universe. I think these medieval arguments uh, take on real credibility in light of science. Uh, virtually everyone these days believes the universe had a beginning at the Big Bang. Um, and this idea that matter, energy, space, and time had a singular beginning fits very well with a classic cosmological argument. If you put it in the form of the Kalam, you know, uh, th- this idea that that uh, everything that begins, uh, everything that begins is brought into existence by God, I think that that's very powerful. Uh, if we move to the fine-tuning, this idea that the universe appears to have been designed, that there is a, is a designing of the fundamental elements that allow for the existence of life, that's a kind of a, an upgrade of the traditional teleological or design argument. The moral argument argues that we have a moral sense within us, uh, that we're moral beings, that we... Uh, experience uh, moral truth and moral elements in our life, I think that that is, as well, a very difficult argument to kind of uh, sidestep. The ontological argument is is the most complicated. Uh, it may not be as used as often, but there are leading Christian thinkers today who argue, as Anselm did and, and other Christian thinkers, that uh, God is a maximally perfect being, and in order for him to have that perfection, 
he must exist. Uh, again, that may take a little more time to develop with a particular Christian, but a person who has a background in philosophy may gravitate that toward that quite easily. So I think these arguments have really kind of experienced a, a renaissance in maybe the last 50 years. Ab no, absolutely the case. Um, uh, when, I, when I have approached these kinds of conversations with laymen, uh, out in the street who are, again, agnostic or atheistic, I find typically more often than not the moral argument has the most sway uh, with a, a non-academic or, a, you know, someone who hasn't consumed their time with philosophical questions, but people who just find themselves indifferent. Like, no, I don't believe in Santa Claus. I don't believe in the Tooth Fairy. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. Um, so when I have conversations with those individuals, the conversation of morality is very interesting, and it seems to have a very strong pull on non-believers on a couple of levels. Um, uh, one being that uh, when you present the moral argument, you have to suggest, look, there is a standard by which all things are good or bad. You know, you ask them rape, murder, and everyone says, yeah, that's bad. Why? And, and if, if you don't have a theistic uh, answer to that, I don't find that you have any answer to that. I feel like the theistic answer is really the only answer that brings a, a moral, uh, we call it a, a justifiable means of morality. All, everyone has a morality. Nobody would claim that an atheist or an agnostic isn't moral. Uh, we're, we're making the case that there's not a justifiable means for that morality outside of theism. After having that, con like you said, the ontological, that, it's so hard sometimes for you know a layman to grasp. Well, okay, you're saying because there is perfection, there is a God. I don't know. But to be able to say there is morality and, and, and to say that there is morality across time, space, and culture must mean that there's a standard by which that morality came from. Uh, uh, that, that seems to be a very compelling argument with those individuals. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you find that when, when talking to a, to a layman that there, there may be some more comprehensible of these four arguments? Yeah, I, I, I like what you've said. Um, I personally think that the moral argument carries a lot of uh, persuasion. It, it, it hits us. Uh, we're moral beings. And, and I agree with you. I don't think anybody lives in a, a universe without morality. I, I, think, I think one of the things that's very difficult for a secular, naturalistic, atheistic worldview is, is to account for things like morality. Not that the other people, uh, not that they don't have morality, but as you would say, how do we justify it? How do we ground it? Uh, why should I treat other people the way I want to be treated? Why should I treat people as if they have inherent dignity and moral worth? Where is that grounded? You know, if there's no God and we're the product of blind, mechanistic, natural, evolutionary processes, it's hard to see how people can have inherent dignity and moral worth, or that there are moral laws or moral truths that are objective in nature. But if God exists and he has created us in his image, I mean, even in the, even in the ancient world of Christianity, the Romans and the Greeks didn't view women and slaves as having the same value that they might other people. But Christianity comes along and says everybody has dignity and moral worth because of the image of God. I think that that's a very powerful way of approaching these issues. How does a naturalist worldview, a world without God, a world of chance, a world of matter in motion, how does it ground objective morality? How, how does it ground uh, a basic dignity for human beings? And I, I think that that's a great place to begin because that can then lead to the question of, of goodness. It can raise the question of our own brokenness, our own sinfulness. If we have a sense of morality, how come we can't keep it? And what is God's solution to that? So I think the moral argument is, is, a, is an invaluable way of reasoning. Again, some of my science colleagues, they love more of the, the science areas of, of design, of yeah. the existence of the universe. And, and for me, I'm, I'm a bit pragmatic when it comes to apologetics. I'm trying to listen to the person, mm -hmm. see where they're at, what concerns do they have, how can I kind of help them to embrace a Christian theistic point of view. But uh, I guess I, 
in the end, I probably would lean toward the moral argument, but I, I have to tell you, I remember the first time I read these arguments seriously and how moved by I was by all of them. Yeah, and I would I would absolutely agree that they're all powerful arguments, and there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, in, in such a such a graphic illustration, every time I say it, I have the image of anyway. Um, uh, but every person is going to have a better you're going to have a better approach with some than you will with others. If they have questions of creation, jumping onto the moral argument is not necessarily something uh, that might appeal to them. However, I just feel uh, I feel. As, as I've had conversations, just personal experience, I see that more often than not, when I, when I dump information about science, people go home and they jump on Google and they try to find every theory that disproves what I just said. And they're going to find someone who, who, who disagrees with me. However, if I appeal to morality, it's, it's subjective enough to where people aren't going to look for objective reasoning upon this and they have to rationalize it internally and go, yeah, there might be something to that. And I think then once th that seems to be my foundation piece. And then when they come to me with additional questions on top of that, that's where I can jump on to some of that other. Oh, now you need data. Now you want data. Let's talk about data. But I feel like yeah. it really is the uh, the gateway drug again, an inappropriate illustration, but the gateway drug to apologetics as it has for me. And I think for many others uh, made the most sense to, to that moral compass of of the the knowing what I know. I, I see this. I acknowledge this. I know that I know this, but I don't know why that I know this. And I think that seems to give people an answer. So um, when when talking about these different arguments, what are, where are the places that you go to study? Are there, are there websites, blogs, podcasts? Are there, you got, you have a podcast. Let us know a little bit about your podcast and, and what you do and talk about on there. Yeah, I, uh, there are a lot of really good sources. Um, I have uh, written a book called Seven Truths That Changed the World. One of the chapters I present um, uh, eight different arguments for God, appealing to, again, different aspects, uh, the origin of the universe, fine-tuning of the universe, the moral argument, um, appealing to uh, explaining our own human condition uh, and various elements. But there are, there are a lot of really good sources. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you're open to reading Thomas Aquinas and you're uh, patient and willing to uh, stretch your mind, uh, the Summa Theologica is a powerful statement. But these arguments are, are reflected by a lot of good theists today. Uh, I mentioned William Lane Craig before, my friend at Biola, J.P. Moreland. Uh, presents the cosmological, teleological argument. Uh, so this material is, is readily available. Uh, and there are other people who have presented. Um, my friend Rob Bowman has a, a popular book, 20 Arguments for God's Existence. So you can start at different places. Uh, if you're new to this, these types of reasoning, there are places to begin. If you have a background in philosophy, uh, there are some very substantive uh, presentations, uh, and reasons.org has uh, lots of articles that relate science to design, science to the beginning of the universe, and that material is available in blogs and various articles. Excellent. Okay, so uh, as we have talked about, uh, you know, some of the the different styles of argument, some of the different apologetic approaches, maybe some resources on, on where we can study. Uh, as, as we approach apologetics, I have seen uh, on the interwebs an uprising, a, a massive uh, 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 push towards presuppositional apologetics. Is this something I've just been completely unaware of, or has it really made huge strides in the last five, ten years uh, in popularity yeah. sense? Presuppositional apologetics is deeply rooted to reform theology. Um, you know, kind of the modern founder of the presuppositional school was Cornelius Van Til, uh, who taught at Old Princeton uh, and then at Westminster Seminary. Uh, presuppositional apologetics is, again, one of those five schools of apologetics. I tend to think, again, the schools have more in common than they do that differ. I, I would recommend, you know, five views of apologetics. 
But there are a couple distinctives to presuppositionalism that I think are important. Um, one is the idea that uh, scripture should guide your apologetic approach, uh, that we shouldn't engage in uh, philosophical apologetics that may possibly be in conflict with some of the fundamental teachings of scripture and God revealing himself. And so ideas there would be that no one is neutral when it comes to uh, philosophical and theological issues. That, that, that is, the human mind is affected by sin, and people presuppose all kinds of ideas. And so when you meet them, you should realize that uh, no, one is, no one is neutral. Um, and I, I think as well, uh, one distinctive element of the presuppositional school and it's common in, in the reasoning of Cornelius Van Til, uh, Greg Bonson, uh, John Frame, Vern Poitras, and, and many others, is the transcendental argument. This idea that, that human beings really can't even begin reasoning or accounting for things like the laws of logic, uh, the fundamental laws of science, uh, mathematics, universes. Uniformity. Uniformity without of appealing nature. to yeah. this this transcendental element. And so the, the argument is that God is able to justify all of this, all of these preconditions for reality. Um, and, and, and so sometimes the presuppositionalists are quite critical of a classical or evidential school. They, they feel like they're not taking into account the fallenness of human beings, or maybe these arguments aren't grounded well enough within scripture. Um, you know, I, I think all of these schools have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and while I like things from them, I'm also critical of them. And I would say I'd much rather talk to a non-Christian than endlessly debate how to do apologetics with other Christians. Um, I think there are times where uh, maybe it would be better to appreciate that people come from different points of view. And, and uh, so there are areas of presuppositionalism I genuinely appreciate, but some of the ideas I, I, I question. Yeah, and the only reason that I, that I bring it up is I, I see some of the more popular presuppositionalists, again, popular in the sense of that I can find them on the Internet. Uh, you know, guys like Cy, I forget his last name, uh, but but science yes. and and the guys at Apologia Radio and the way that they go out and they they talk to people on the street um, and again I commend them for what they're doing uh, with yes. pro life movement I commend them uh, for what they're doing on their theology shows great stuff you know not not looking to hate not looking to uh, you know to criticize but I'm curious when I, I watch their approach they come up to Christian they come up to non believers and say you know let's talk about God no I don't believe in God yes you do and they just they they discredit their word as if the unbeliever is lying. And the idea is, you know, that a fool says in his heart that there's no God. Obviously, there's a God because, you know, Romans 2 says that we're all without excuse. We all know we just suppress the truth with unrighteousness. So they come in and they basically believe what the Bible says about them more than what they say about themselves. No, you definitely believe in there that there's a God. And I'm going to ignore the fact that you say that because I know that you're lying. And the way that it comes off is super abrasive. And again, not saying it's right or wrong, uh, but I think when you're when you're watching it, it is a culture shock to evangelism. When when you're you're trying to study on how to do evangelism, maybe you've done, you know, uh, the way of the master or the evangelism explosion or any of those things. When, you know that was re real popular in the '90s. But but when you approach evangelism, that that seemed so odd when I first started seeing it, and it seemed in many cases to have a fruitful approach, um, in the in the sense that you could catch people in a good argument. But it seemed always like that very uh, uh, gotcha kind of play, you know journalism like gotcha you know you don't have an answer to this one yeah. and and I think people yeah. just walk away frustrated and and disheartened. Uh, again, maybe it works. I don't know. Uh, but but maybe you could speak to that. How, how do we as Christians? Because yeah. again, I, I think that there's there's uh, there's validity and even commendable nature to approach a person. Uh, believing what the scripture says about them more than what they say about themselves. I think that's commendable. But how do we approach that uh, in, in, in an entry-level way to talk to a non-believer? Yeah, I, I share your your thoughts there. I, 
I certainly think the presuppositional school uh, is very helpful in acknowledging that people have presuppositions about reality and we should ask them, how do you justify and ground those presuppositions about reality? Um, on the other hand, I, I think you want to have a fruitful interaction with people and telling them they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, even though, in fact, they may be, that, that is, an, I think, an approach that really opens up uh, dialogue. I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think there are times where there's a lot of rhetoric involved in a presuppositional approach. And I think that more argument needs to be made. Why is it that Christianity is the only worldview that can ground and justify all these preconditions of reality? Mm. I mean, sometimes I ask my presuppositional friend, why couldn't a Jew or a Muslim, according to their religious tradition, have kind of a presuppositional approach? So I think, I think in my own way of thinking is I like to approach people and say, look, how does your worldview account for these realities of life? I mean, the fact that we, we have a real world, uh, that this world seems to have so much design and purpose and meaning in it, how, how does your worldview explain the human condition, morality, uh, you know, and, and how about all of these invisible things we can't see that are so critical, like math, science, uh, the laws of logic? I would ask them questions uh, to, to really kind of uh, get them to think about, you know, what is their deepest thoughts about the nature of reality? And uh, you know, I might decide, as you have, to, to, partic to choose one of those particular areas of morality. Um, but again, I, I, I think that uh, I, I think it's helpful to kind of see these as different schools. And for me, I'm a cumulative case kind of guy. I, I like to argue that the Christian worldview has robust explanatory power, that its scope of explanation is, is very deep. Uh, you know, I, and I, I think that presenting people with a, a worldview vision of Christianity uh, that is logically coherent, that explains so much of reality, can be very, very powerful to people. And we can compare and contrast these other worldviews. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, I think apologetics can, can be a powerful tool to get that conversation back on, you know, well, who is Jesus Christ? What what did he do on the cross? And what is the what's the very foundation of our faith as Christians? That's good. So, uh, you know, when we're we're having this conversation about apologetics, what comes to my mind is pastors and church members uh, in local congregations that I have attended that will say things like, "Well, I'm no theologian," or "Who needs theology?" Right? I just have a personal relationship with Jesus. I always tell them Jesus is a four foot three Asian woman and they suddenly go, no, he's not. I'm like, you're doing it. You're doing theology. Um, I, I do gotcha moment with Christians. I, I choose not to do that too much with non-believers, but um, the, the gotcha moment with Christians, you know, uh, theology is not only necessary, but mandatory in my mind for Christians. I think we need to have a very historical, I would be inclined to go back to, a, you know, a catechism style system where we go back to like the Heidelberg, or we go back to the early confessions, uh, even for church membership to say, look, we need a historic, a deep historic knowledge of the faith. Um, so, so that when we come together, you're raising your children, that all of us, the whole collective body has an understanding of basic theology that's been around for thousands of years. We're not talking about, you know, uh, uh, every, every style of, of, of witnessing out there, but, but we need to know who Christ is, what he's done, that kind of thing. Uh, to, to say all of that, when we talk about apologetics, that probably gets under your skin, I would imagine, when people say, well, I don't really need, that's, that's the evangelist job, that's, someone else will do that in the body of Christ. How much of this does every believer need? Um, do you think that every believer needs to be uh, uh, well studied on apologetics, or that every, every believer needs to give some kind of defense for their faith? I mean, all of these examples that you've given, uh, there, there's almost an inexhaustible amount of time to really uh, sharpen yourself in all of those areas, and I would imagine 
uh, as as philosophy continues to progress, that those thoughts are getting rehashed and renewed every single day. So how much time do we really invest into the study of apologetics as, as an everyday believer? Uh, that's a very appropriate question. Uh, I don't expect every Christian to, to have a, a depth of knowledge of philosophy or, or science or, you know, um, studies in biblical texts. I, I do think, given the world in which we live, that every Christian should be able to think clearly and carefully about their faith. What, what do I believe about God? What do I believe about the person of Christ? What is the Christian perspective on the fallen nature of human beings? What did Christ do on the cross that makes me right with God? A, a basic understanding. Often I will appeal to the Apostles' Creed, you know, 115 words describing what I think is, is a, uh, a description of historic Christianity. And so I think the first thing that a Christian needs is, is to be able to, to think clearly and carefully about their faith. Um, a, a catechism, a creedal type of approach, I think is very powerful. There are creeds in scripture. Uh, creeds were derived from scripture. Um, I think, secondly, being able to talk intelligently about your faith. How, what does Christianity say about morality? What, what, what does Christianity say about other religions? I, I don't think you have to know everything, but I, I do think that we ought to, in our churches, help, uh, help equip Christians to, to think on their feet, uh, to develop uh, a thoughtful presentation of, of what are the reasons they believe that God exists, why Christianity is true, uh, and be able to interact with people. You can always say in conversation, and I've done this many times, you know, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm not really sure how to respond to that. Let me go back and do a little research. Maybe we can, we can meet up again and discuss those kinds of things. But I do think our churches need to help Christians to be grounded in historic Christianity and to have a basic knowledge of their Christian worldview and how it, how it interfaces with the other belief systems. You can always spend the rest of your life studying these topics and they're seemingly never ending, but uh, you know, some good equipping. I, uh, I think pastors can help their people enormously by, by helping them to just kind of think through their faith and how to talk about it intelligently. That's good. Okay, so um, as as the, 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 the topic of uh, evangel, do, do you find that evangelism and apologetics are s- separated um, in the sense that evangelism is just telling people about the gospel where apologetics is more of a defense or uh, a, a lot more rationale and reasoning? Do you find that those things are separable or that those things are really intertwined and they're just more of an academic name uh, slapped on apologetics? Well, I, again, I would say historically, apologetics was a school or a branch of theology. And so I, I think at times... Uh, you know, people can engage in apologetic issues apart from kind of a broader theological point of view, but I tend to see them as, as together. I, I think there are times where people have objections to the Christian faith. Maybe it's the problem of evil, or maybe it, how can Christianity be true in light of all these other religions, or how can Christianity be true with evolution? So there may be many paths that a person may come to and say, here's my objection to the basic historic Christian point of view. I see evangelism and apologetics working uh, in context together. Uh, I think apologetics can, can help take a, a problem off the table so the person can come back and give greater consideration for the truth of Christianity. But I, I think that today, in a world with the internet, in a world that is shrinking because of technology, uh, I mean, I live in Southern California. Uh, it may be one of the most diverse religious uh, places in the world. I mean, 50 years ago, if I wanted to talk with a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu, I'd have to go overseas. 
uh, t today you, your your kids are probably on a soccer team with a family that is a Hindu or a Buddhist. Uh, you you may have neighbors or relatives, a cousin who is an atheist. I think it is a time in which we live in which uh, apologetics really is a, an important skill for Christians in varying degrees to, to develop. I don't expect everybody to have a PhD. I don't expect everybody to devote the kind of time that you or I would to these types of topics. But I don't think it's, I don't think we can, we can live again in a world where we're oblivious to the challenges of the faith or other philosophical systems. Okay, so one of the, the questions that, that's running through my mind is about how, you know, being raised in more of a fundamentalist movement where these are, are good things to do, these are bad things to do, we, we kind of created this this sheltered box almost to where you, you don't need to own a Quran, you know, you don't get that in your house, you know, they, each of those come prepackaged with 16 demons, you know, you don't need that in your house. But, uh, uh, but, 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 but on what level, how much do we study um, these these pagan philosophies, these pagan theologies, these um, these ungodly practices on some level. When you start studying out some of these philosophical understandings, you know Paul he he references uh, pagan philosophers when he's when he, when he's uh, doing the Mars Hill account. And and when when we approach theology, how much of the enemy's playbook do we need to be studying? Yeah, well, it's a, it's again a I, I think part of the question is the place a person has in life, how much exposure they're going to have to these kinds of things. You know, in, in, in historic Christianity, um, I think oftentimes the best critiques of different philosophical and religious systems, call them pagan, whatever they may be, often comes from Christians who have an inside knowledge. I, I think of St. Augustine's critique of the Greco-Roman world in the city of God he knew that system inside and out mm. and was able to detect its incoherences, its problems. I'm not saying everybody has to have that kind of level, but I think, uh, I think introducing Christians to basic worldview thinking, that there are fundamental worldviews, prisms, uh, grand narratives of explanation. Uh, you're going to encounter people who hold these views, uh, either secular naturalism, Eastern mysticism, uh, Islamic theism, or, or Christian, historic Christianity. What do they view about God? What do they view about the nature of the world? Uh, what do they think about morality? How do they make sense of these kinds of things? I think giving people a, a, a basic framework and telling them if you'd like to go further. I mean, last year I debated a Hindu scholar and a Buddhist scholar. Uh, we talked back and forth about various issues. I, I wrote a book last year entitled God Among Sages, where I compare Jesus to Krishna, Buddha, uh, Confucius, and Muhammad. You can always go deeper. There's always more material you can be exposed to. And I think every Christian should be aware that uh, there, there are fundamental challenges that people are going to raise about faith, uh, the problem of pain and suffering and evil. People are also going to say, you know, how can I have faith? I, I don't need faith. I have science. These kinds of questions, I don't think ever go away. They're always going to be there. I think building up some understanding and facility in them can be very, very meaningful. You know, I was talking with a physicist just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. I said to him, he teaches at a secular university. And I said, so are your, are your colleagues, are they hostile to Christianity? Are, are you in a hostile environment? He looked at me and said, you know, Ken, for the most part, they're completely indifferent. I, I have to try to get them to talk about the big issues of life. And I thought, wow, here is a, a physicist. Here is a guy who is, is a leading academic thinker. And he's telling me that most of his science colleagues, uh, you know, they, they have a job. They have a family. They, they have all kinds of things. And it's not like they're always pushing his perspective away. He has to kind of engage them. So I think apologetics can be a very valuable tool. Um, I'm concerned that our churches, well, to be frank, I'm concerned that there's a lot of anti-intellectualism in our churches. Yeah. Sometimes we're taught things like 
you know, thinking too much is unspiritual or, you know, that God, God has, God is more about experiences and, and that the mind is somehow less valuable. I think those are things that we need to help Christians think through these types of issues. And, you know, so education, what a, what a powerful thing, a good doctrinal theological education, a basic philosophical worldview education, uh, an, an apologetics education. These are, these are invaluable tools to people who go away to the university, who encounter people from different points of view. I like to train people uh, to think carefully about their faith, to develop an articulate, winsome attitude about communicating, and, and a love of reading, a love of learning, uh, a love of engagement with ideas. And if we can do that, I think we're helping people enormously. Yeah, I remember when I was in, in high school, uh, we took a class called Understanding the Times, and that class helped me tremendously uh, as a, I want to say, 16, 17-year-old, and uh, to be able to to comprehend, and you, you, at the beginning of the last question, you stated, you know, humanism, cosmic humanism, polytheism, and to be able to group uh, the faiths of the world into these kind of segments to say, oh, give me an understanding of what you believe about God, and I can instantly kind of compartmentalize you into a place, in my mind at least, to say, oh, okay, so I, I don't have to know every god or every every way of worship, but I can at least comprehend what vantage they're coming from. And that was a, a super helpful, uh, you know, approach to me. To, to this day, I hold uh, some uh, some pro-life arguments that I got from that class. I learned at 16, super helpful to me. I've reached out to people who, um, you know, are, are definitely more liberal in that, in that view of abortion, and I've had discussions with them, and every single one of them that I got done having, using the, the size, level of development, environment, and dependency argument, the sled argument, to talk about the difference between a fetus and, and a full-grown adult, you know, those are the differences. None of those, uh, you know, uncategorize a, a person, an adult from being human. So why should we uncategorize them, you know, for, for uh, life in the womb, that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, every single conversation we've walked away, three of them, I think three of the five conversations, they walked away going, man, I'm, I need to really consider this pro-life thing. Like this is, this is new to me uh, to, to have a reasonable defense of just logic to kind of explain Oh, that makes sense. I mean, I didn't quote the Bible. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't quote faith or Jesus. I just said rationally, this makes sense. And to be able to understand people's worldview and just to dialogue with them with logic, things that just make sense, it's it's helpful in our conversations. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I learned in that in that class is, is Mormon theology. They talk about how we have the same vocabulary, but we have a different dictionary, and how they will use yeah. the same words we use. Uh, but those words actually mean something completely different, and they will suck you into that web and get you stuck deep into that system if you don't know that the words that they're saying actually mean something different. And that's, I think, everyone should take a worldviews class for that reason, that when we're having this apologetic evangelistic conversation with people, that when they use certain words uh, like son of God or only begotten son of God, that those words, uh, we know what they mean when other people say them. Uh, so, so comprehending that advantage and, and that understanding, uh, w what are, you know, what are ways that uh, we we as believers can approach agnostic people? Because uh, again, I think most of our conversation, even today, we've talked a little bit polytheism and some of that other stuff. But uh, I find that most apologetics target uh, atheists in the fact that we say there is no God. How do we leverage apologetics to people who? Who, who are just agnostic that say, I don't know what I believe. I think there might be a God, but I'm not so convinced it's the Christian God. Where, where would you move forward, forward with an individual like that? Yeah, that's, I, I think it's especially helpful given our context. I mean, we, we have the influx of a postmodern way of thinking and postmodernism puts a great emphasis upon uh, a relativistic uh, thinking about truth and knowledge and the concern on the part of the postmodernists is that people are making knowledge claims that they can't buttress. I, I, I often think that when it comes to agnostics, when it comes to people who have doubts, um, I, I like to look at the historical arguments. I like to 
make a case that Christianity has a, a foundation that's rooted in history, that there are things we know about the New Testament, there are things that we can credibly and reliably know about Jesus Christ. Um, I, th I think as well, if, if they're more philosophically inclined, uh, I think developing the idea of there are certain things about knowledge that we can know and that, that you know, faith isn't opposed to knowledge. Faith isn't opposed to um, a reason and rationality. I, I also think an, another element in this kind of context is, is kind of helping people to, to examine their doubts or their areas. What, it, what is it about Christianity that, that you do doubt? Or, um, you know, I think what was fascinating to me was uh, reading a book by Gary Habermas where he said that, you know, doubt has different elements. Sometimes it's, it's a, a lack of, or a problem with, with facts and knowledge and evidence. Other times it's more of emotional doubts. People, people have doubts because they're broken, disconnected individuals. Um, and so when it comes to people who, who say that uh, they have doubts or they have a lack of certainty uh, or they're unsure about these kinds of things, I might try to build up a, a case for things that we can affirm about the nature of, of truth, the nature of reality, uh, the truth of historic Christianity, and, and kind of kind of go with them where they are. What, it, what is it that they doubt? What is it that they feel like they have to suspend uh, knowledge of. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, one element we haven't talked about, I believe in what I call the golden rule of apologetics. And what that is, of course, the golden rule is it, our striving. Nobody does it perfectly. That's why we need a savior. But the golden rule is we strive. We endeavor to treat other people the way we want to be treated. The golden rule of apologetics is treat other people's beliefs the way you want yours treated. And all I mean by that is treat them respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, give, give them give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, respect, treat their points of view with, with integrity. Um, I don't necessarily want to jump in and say, well, you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Of course, I know from a scriptural vantage point that people, are not neutral and are always gravitating and dodging God, but I want to I want to reach in and say what are the sources of your doubt? What what is it that keeps you in a position where you can't affirm the truth of particular things? And you know when I read Aristotle, Aristotle had a classic book on rhetoric. He's the father of logic, but he also wrote on rhetoric. He says what you need to persuade somebody is logos, ethos, and pathos. I want the logical argument, but that pathos where we get words like sympathy and empathy and, and, and you know, uh, the, the idea of uh, ethics there, um, I want to be a credible person. So, you know, apologetics is not about winning. It, it's, it's about helping people to see truth more clearly and more carefully and and to uh, give careful consideration. So that's how I kind of approach. I have a lot of students uh, when I taught philosophy at a secular university, secular college, they often would arrive at kind of an agnostic position. They thought they were safe in the middle. Mm -hmm. But I would say, well, I, I want you to I want you to kind of lay out your agnosticism. I, I want you to defend your agnosticism. And that's where I think arguments, factual arguments about faith, uh, about reasoning can be helpful. Excellent. So uh, you had mentioned uh, earlier in one, in one question about uh, the church and having experienced or having choosing to prioritize experience above knowledge. And I would sympathize with that very strongly. And then you mentioned postmodernism. Do you think that postmodernism has affected the church in that way? Because we can talk about experiences that are subjective opposed to um, objective truth. I, I, I certainly think postmodernism has opened up maybe a quagmire of relativism and morality, relativism and truth. I think it's, 
I think it's kind of checked a lot of people who make maybe an overreach in terms of, of, of reasoning. But, you know, I'll tell you a brief story. Um, raised Catholic, became an evangelical Protestant, began attending a charismatic church. And I was studying philosophy at the university. I was in a charismatic church, and I noticed very quickly that at school they didn't talk about faith. And at church, we didn't talk about reason. And I felt like a man without a country. I, I kind of felt like I didn't fit. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember one of the pastors even saying that, you know, as a student in philosophy, I thought too much. I, you know, I, I kind of wanted to say, well, maybe that's not your problem, but I felt kind of left out. And it was yeah. only when I encountered a Christian philosopher who said, Ken, maybe you ought to read St. Augustine. Maybe I ought to go back and read a little Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, there are, other, there are other people that use their mind to love God. And what I often say to my charismatic uh, friends, to my Pentecostal friends, is my view is loving God with my mind, uh, you know, developing the life of the mind to the glory of God, that God has given me a remarkable gift. All of us have a gift of our minds. He wants us to use our entire being, heart, mind, soul, and strength to, to love him. And I, I think there are times where the impression is given that, that faith and reason are, are, are hostile to one another. And quite to be perfectly candid, I think a lot of intellectual Christians have a hard time with church at times oh, yeah. because the experience of church doesn't always kind of allow them to explore the things that are critically important to them. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to go to a church that's cerebral and cold and lacks passion and conviction. I would like <clears throat> hospitality. I like Christians who are feelers and lovers, uh, people who care about me. Uh, I think, however, you know, we have this dichotomy, and I don't think it's ever it's ever gone away. And I think our culture kind of leads it, uh, exacerbates that kind of challenge. But I'm a man of reason and a man of faith because faith and reason are compatible; they go together. Man, that's good. Um, let me do this one. Uh, man, it's been an honor to have you on the show today. Uh, we got to wrap up as uh, we've been <laughs> about an hour into the program. I thank you so much for coming on the program. One last time, how do, how do people follow you and get in contact with you and your content? Yeah, uh, you can go to reasons.org. Uh, reasons to Believe has a website. There is lots of apologetic material. Uh, we do especially science and faith issues, but I address theological, doctrinal, apologetics of other varieties. Uh, I'm on social media, Ken's, Kenneth R. Samples, uh, places where you can you can uh, contact with me. I've, I've written or co-written or contributed to 12 books. So there's a lot of material. I have hundreds and hundreds of articles. Uh, my blog, Reflections by Ken at wordpress.com. Uh, lots of articles you can download for free. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty easy to bump into. Excellent. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on the program today. It's been a blessing to have you to rehash some of this apologetic stuff. I'd love to have you back on in the future. It's been an honor. Uh, but for those of you uh, who are watching the program, you'd like to watch this program and any other program like this, you can watch them at our website, theremnantradio.com, or you can check us out on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, etc 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 basically every platform or media is distributed that's where we want to be so thank you guys so much for watching this program you can watch us every single monday night at 8 30 p.m central standard time and be looking forward to in 2018 uh, just just next week and, and, and the weeks following uh, we will be having we, we intend to begin producing and recording mini series where we're going to go after uh you know a uh, mini series on apologetics a mini series on church history we did a systematic theology mini series with michael mitchell if you're interested in that, you can go check that out on our YouTube channel. There's a playlist called Systematic Theology. It's like a nine or ten uh, part episode, or nine or ten part series, uh, talking about systematic theology. It's been fun. 
hope to see you guys next week, Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. You guys be blessed.